Praise the Lord, I'm so excited to be with you guys here today. Um, this is one of my favorite churches in all of the world. I love seeing your smiling faces. I love hearing the beautiful, amazing worship. And I am so excited to be with you here today. I bring greetings from my family um, in the United States. My wife is here with me. We do have four children that are in the States. I bring greetings from my church to our church here, Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia, and from my pastor, Pastor Joe, to his brothers and sisters here as well. I do want to say happy Father's Day to all of the fathers that are out here. Praise the Lord for godly fathers, amen? Uh, happy Father's Day to my dad who is soundly asleep right now. But listen, the world needs Godly men, godly women as well. But today on Father's Day, the world is severely lacking godly men who will stand up within their families, within their communities, and live according to the scriptures, treating their wives the way that the scriptures tell them to, raising their children in the way that the scriptures tell them to. And as the, as the men go, as the fathers go, so go their families, right? So pray and celebrate godly Christian men and pray that the Lord would raise up more of them as amazing things will be done through that. But would you join me in prayer right now? Lord, <clears throat> I thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for your word, Lord. We ask your blessing now on the study of your word, that our hearts, our minds, our ears would be open to the things that you would speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to share with you guys today the secret to having an effective, a fruitful spiritual life. The secret to an effective and fruitful spiritual life. You want to hear what it is? Buy that oil that Josh was selling for 10,000... Sh- no, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> the secret to an effective, fruitful, spiritual ministry is to be faithful in the little things. That's the key. You want to do great things for the Lord? And we should. We should have that desire. I want to do great things for the Lord. If you have that desire to do great things for the Lord... Be faithful in the little things. So I'm going to look at three passages today. The first one, we're going to see where this biblical principle comes from. This idea of being faithful in the little things. Secondly, I'm going to look at a passage where we see an example of two men who were faithful in the little things and God did amazing things through their lives. And then thirdly, and where I'll spend most of the time is I want to look at a place where it tells us how do we apply this to our lives how should I take these little things and live them out on a daily basis? So the first place we're going to look is in the book of Luke, chapter 16. And this is where we get this biblical principle for being faithful in the small things. Now, the whole first half of Luke, chapter 16, Jesus is telling a parable. And it's... it's um, it's, a, it's called the parable of the unjust steward. And there's this guy there, and, and basically he's, he's not doing good things, but he ends up making a wise business decision at the end. I'm not going to teach through the parable. I want to focus on what Jesus says afterwards. And Jesus commends in this wise business decision that he makes, but then he brings a spiritual principle through that. So we're going to look at verses 10 through 12, and this is what Jesus says about this parable that he's just told. He says, he who is faithful in what is least will also be faithful in much, and he who is unjust or unfaithful in what is least also be unjust in much. So this is the biblical principle here, faithful in the little things. You want to do great things for the Lord? And do all the small things well. Uh, just recently, one of my daughters got her driver's license. And on the day that she got her license, she said, Dad, I want to drive to my friend's birthday party. And her friend lived far away. She'd never driven to this area before. 
And I said, no, you can't drive that far. Even though legally you are allowed to do that now, you cannot do that. And she said why. She was upset about it. And I said, you just got your license today. And you've only driven around close by to our house. You, you can drive to work. You can drive to your school. Those things are very close. And I said, show me that you're capable of doing those things on your own without me or your mother in the car. And then we can build off of that. Show me that you're capable of doing these small things and we can build off of that. And the spiritual principle is the same. Now, it's interesting as you read through this parable Jesus says, if you're faithful in the little or the least, you will be faithful in much. And this parable, he's talking about money. And in this, he's saying this, money is actually the least thing. It's interesting to think through that, right? Because we tend to think money about money as that's the goal. That's the goal of my life. That's the goal of my ministry. But spiritually speaking, That's the least of these things. Think about when we're in heaven. There will be no need for money, right? Money is a purely earthly thing. And when you're talking about spiritual matters, money is the least of those things. But we are still to be faithful in that thing. So unfortunately, too many times money has brought shame on the name of the Lord through greedy pastors and greedy churches and greedy individuals. It has broken up friendships and it has broken up families. And we need to be very careful how we deal with money. But in the spiritual sense, is actually the lowest the least of the things. In verse 11, it says, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, money, who will commit to you, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you're not faithful with money, this is what Jesus says, you will not be faithful with the true riches. A lot of times we think, man, if I just had more money, if I just had a little bit more money, think of all the things I could do for the Lord. Think of all the things I could do for you, God, if I just had a little bit more money. Well, that's not true. Because money is not what the true riches are. It's going to perish one day. We're not faithful in what we have so that we can get more. That's not what Jesus says. Be faithful in the little things. Be faithful with the money that you have so that you can have more money. That's not what Jesus says. He says be faithful in these little things so that you can actually obtain or be entrusted with the true riches. So what then are the greater things? What are the true riches? Well, I would ask you this. What is the greatest price that has ever been paid by anyone for anything? What is the greatest price that has ever been paid by anyone for anything? And that would be Jesus Christ giving, sacrificing his life to purchase our freedom, to pay our sin debt what did Jesus purchase with that? The souls of men, right? The souls of men and women. That's the greatest riches. Jesus says you're faithful in these little things so that you can show you can be entrusted with the hearts and the minds and the lives of the precious people around you that I already paid my blood for them. That's the greatest thing that a pastor or a church or an individual can be involved with when lost souls find Christ. To help lead someone to Christ, to shepherd their heart, to disciple them. It's the most beautiful thing that we can do. And it's unrelated to anything financial. And that's beautiful, right? It's not the rich man or the poor man that's entrusted with the hearts and souls of other men and women. It's the faithful man and the faithful woman. 
How beautiful to see someone come from death to life, from darkness into light, to walk through the gospel with someone, to pray with them, to see them be born again. Those are the riches that are eternal. Those are the riches that we will be celebrating a thousand years from now, 10,000 years, a million years, the souls of men and women that we were able to touch through our lives. Those are the riches that will endure. (coughs) Sorry, excuse me. And listen, if a church or an individual is not faithful with the small things, God is not going to entrust with them the greatest things, the hearts and souls of men. Now, it's an interesting thing to see because some of the largest churches in the world have actually have terrible pastors that are over them. And we can look at that it can, and it can be confusing to us. But I would say this, those are wolves who are praying and feeding on their congregation to make themselves rich. They are using the gospel for gain. And that is not a work of the spirit. That's a work of the enemy. And they're leading people towards a path of destruction. And there's a judgment that is awaiting those pastors. If we can even call them pastors. The pastor is a shepherd. And they're not shepherds, they're wolves. And there's a judgment that awaits those that are feeding on their flock instead of feeding their flock. So don't be deceived about that. But God, a church that truly loves the Lord, if they're not faithful in the little things, God's not going to entrust them with the hearts and souls and minds and lives of men. And then verse 12, he says, if you have not been faithful in another man's work, who will give you what is your own? And this speaks to all of us. Whether you're a pastor, an assistant pastor, a ministry worker, a mom, a dad, a young person, we are, we are all involved in another man's work on some capacity. It's all the work of the Lord, right? It all belongs to him. And whatever God has called you to, whatever that is, and you each have your own giftings and callings from the Lord, from the youngest to the oldest, male and female, Whatever God has called you to do, be faithful in that. You're not trying to raise yourself up over somebody, not trying to push other people down so that you can be exalted, make yourself higher so you can take over. You say, well, yeah, God, I know, I know in my heart that God has called me to do this. Well, maybe that's true, but that's not what he's called you to right now. What he's called you to right now is to be faithful where he's planted you and the things that he has put before you. And if he wants to raise you up, he will do that in his time. And God's timing is perfect. My timing is not. God's timing is perfect. So the biblical principle, being faithful in the little things from Jesus himself, and I want you to flip over to Acts chapter 6 now. I want, I want to look at an example of two men who were faithful in small things. This is Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Thank you. Because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So here we have a situation where there's a problem in this church in Jerusalem. There is a marginalized group of people that's not being taken care of the way that they should. So it says the Hebrews and the Hellenists. If you think of the Hebrews, they would be the Jewish people who were uh, born and raised in Israel. The Hellenists would be Jewish by descent who were perhaps born and raised in another country. So these are all Jewish Christians here at the church. 
And ethnically, they were the same, but culturally, they would have been different just because of where they had grown up. They probably spoke different languages. The Hellenists most likely spoke Greek, and the Hebrews would have spoken Aramaic and Hebrew. So think about perhaps um, someone who was Kenyan by ethnicity, by race, but they were raised maybe in one of the surrounding countries or perhaps even in Europe or something like that. And then they moved back to Kenya. And you would say, yeah, I mean, they're Kenyan, but they're not really Kenyan, right, are they? They didn't grow up where we grew up. They didn't grow up in this country. They, they didn't learn the things that we learned. And so you might look at them a little bit differently than you would the other people who grew up around you. And that's what's happening in this church here. <clears throat> these, these Hellenists, the ones that had grown up outside of Israel but had come back, they were being mistreated. And so the leadership recognizes the problem, which is good. It's good when the church leadership recognizes when there's issues. And the leadership, we don't ever want to be too proud to where if people bring complaints or problems to us, we, we just brush those off and say, you, you don't know what you're talking about. It's good to be able, when, when people have um, things that they point out to you, if it's a legitimate problem, to take that into consideration. And they say in verse 2, then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. <clears throat> so they recognize something else within this as well. They recognize their own calling and the limitations that they had. See, they said, we're called to teach. And in order for us to deal with this problem directly would take away from our ability or our availability to teach the word, which is our primary calling. So that would have been a problem. If they tried to do both of those things on their own, what you end up with is not doing either one of them very well. Like if you tried to go to medical school and you tried to go to law school at the same time, you're not going to do either one of those things very well because they're both difficult and they're both time-consuming. Pastoring, teaching the word is time-consuming. This ministry that was now in front of them was also going to be time-consuming. And they said, we can't leave the teaching of the word to do this. So what do they do? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Verses 3 and 4. Their solution, it says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they recognized their own calling was to teach. But there is this problem. So how do they deal with it? They don't just give it to anybody. They say, hey, no, these people may have been neglected, but this is an important thing. And what we want to do is we want to give this job to faithful Men. How did they choose the men to take over this ministry? They looked for ones that were already being faithful in their daily lives. It said they needed to be of good reputation. If you asked people about them, everyone had good things to say. They were well thought of amongst the brethren. They had a good reputation and they were full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. The work of the Holy Spirit was evident in their lives. We don't know in, in what way that was manifesting itself, except to say that it was evident that their lives since Christ were very different than what they were before Christ. See, there's a principle there, just in general. We know when we get saved, God indwells us with his Holy Spirit. And it's impossible for the Spirit of God to come into a man or a woman and for that life not to change. If I now have God's spirit indwelling in me, it's impossible for my life to be the same as it once was. And this is evident in these men's lives. Now understand, this may have been considered a low job if you was looked on by the outside world. Who wants to take care of these foreigner widows? 
The solo, in fact, it hadn't even been recognized by the leadership until it was brought to their attention. <clears throat> but yet notice the requirement in order to serve in this ministry. You had to have a good reputation, you had to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you had to be full of wisdom to serve tables, it says. There are no unimportant jobs in the kingdom of God. The way that I conduct myself in my life and in any type of ministry will either bring glory to God or shame. And they said, any job within the church is an important job and the way the men that we put over this ministry will either bring glory to God or it will be shame, a shame to him. There are no unimportant jobs in the kingdom. May that encourage you today. Whatever your role is, God can and will use you if you are faithful. That means we don't go in with the expectation that I'm going to be put in charge and have some big role. I should go in with the expectation to serve. And then if God wants to add to my responsibility, he can do that as I show myself to be faithful. In verse 5 and 6, it says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, who we might be familiar with. We're going to see him later on. A man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And Philip, we're going to see this man later on as well. And Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And then verse 7 says, and look at this, then the word of God spread. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. When everybody was doing the role that God had created for them, when the church was functioning as the church, each member with its different role within the church, it says the word of God spread and disciples uh, multiplied rapidly. That's what we want to see. It's not people fighting for position or prominence. It's everybody doing the role that God had called them to. You say, well, God, yeah, I, I know he showed me I'm going to do this or that one day. Well, listen, that might be, but be faithful where he's called you right now. It's such an important thing for us to understand. There's no secret growth formula for the church. It's be faithful and train up faithful men, disciple people under you. You want to have an effective life, spiritual life, be faithful and train up faithful men and women under you. Uh, but I want you to see what happens in these two men's lives. Stephen, one of the men chosen, he was faithful in his personal life. So then he was chosen to serve in this ministry. And as he's faithful in that, look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So the Holy Spirit comes upon him. He starts doing miraculous things. And people rise up against him. And then he begins to preach, and the religious leaders hate on him. And then in verse 7, we see he gives this phenomenal sermon in front of all of the religious leaders, which ultimately ends up leading to Stephen being stoned to death. And we say, wow, man, that was very short-lived ministry, right? <laughs> but think about the life of Stephen we're still talking about it 2,000 years further along, right? Stephen was faithful in his personal life. He was faithful in the ministry that was presented to him. And God did this amazing thing through his life which brought glory to his name. And then the other one that we know of is Philip. You might know him as Philip the Evangelist. We see several times where he's preaching, but I want to look at one event uh, just very briefly in Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> starting in verse 26. It says, now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, 
who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. And as you read on, Philip goes and he begins to converse with this man. He begins to explain the scriptures to him. This Ethiopian man receives Christ, gets baptized, and then the Lord takes Philip out of there. Philip is gone. And that's really the end of that little story there. But the truth is, in the history of Christianity, that was just the beginning of the story. As do you realize that that there in Acts chapter 8 is when the gospel came to Africa through this Ethiopian man that got saved by Philip. That's when the gospel came to Africa. He was on his way home and he brought it back with him. You think about that, right? Philip, we see Acts chapter 6, faithful in his personal life, faithful in his ministry, and the Lord does this amazing thing through him. Many of you sitting here today because Philip preached to that man and explained the scriptures to him and he brought the gospel But listen, both of those things, Stephen's martyr, the gospel coming to Africa through Philip, those things don't happen without the faithfulness that we see in Acts chapter 6. They were faithful in the little things, and God used their lives in amazing ways. I'm going to close out here, turning to one more passage. What do we do with this? How do I take this? How can I be faithful in the little things in my life? So I want to look with you guys in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Timothy uh, was, Paul considered him his son in the faith. He ministered with Paul. He was discipled by Paul. And at this point, as Paul is writing this letter, Timothy is pastoring the church in Ephesus, which Paul uh, had had been the one to bring the gospel there initially. And so these are Paul's instructions to him as a pastor. But we can take these things and we can apply them to our lives as as individuals as well. And so I want to look at chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, starting in verse 12. He says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in six ways, in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And I want to start out by saying these things that we're going to go through, this list here, we need to be doing these things in our churches and we need to be doing these things in our homes. So six ways that we can be faithful in our daily life. First is in word. The things that we say matter. Not just the pastor from the pulpit. The things that we all say matter. Our words have the power to build people up and they have the power to tear people down especially if you're in a position of authority, whether that's as a pastor or as a boss or as a teacher or as a parent, your words carry extra weight. Some of you perhaps have been torn down by somebody in authority over you and you know how devastating that can be. Our words have power. What kind of speech are we known for? That Psalm 34 was read today. 34.1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my lips. Can we say that about my life? Is the praise of the Lord continually on my lips? Now, it's easy to do that when things are going well, right? To sing the praises of the Lord. But what about when I'm going through difficulties? Are the praises of the Lord continually on my lips in those situations? I remember a time... uh, when we were living in a village in China and we went away for about a week and while we were, while we were away, it snowed at the, at the house in the village that we were living in. And so we came back and all of the pipes, that, all of the water pipes had burst open because they froze and got ice inside and it expanded. It burst all of the pipes. We lost all of the water that was, that was on our roof. And inside of our house, the temperature was zero degrees. Inside of our house. 
zero degrees for about one month. And I will tell you, I was struggling with the praise of the Lord being on my lips as I was sitting in my house with the temperature at zero degrees. Little kids. And I said, Lord, my, the things on my mouth was, Lord, get me out of here, right? But listen, the, the praise, I, I, I don't just bless the Lord when things are going well. His praise is on my lips continually. First Thessalonians 5 says, pray without ceasing. Do I do that? Are my prayers rising to the Lord throughout the day? Am I speaking life over my family? My words have that power. If I, listen, if I as a parent, if I yell at my child in the morning, that's how I sent them off that day, with a dark cloud over them. Did I yell at them before they went to sleep at night? I don't want that, those words of death, to be the last thing over my children before they go to bed at night. How about with your wives, husbands? How do you speak to them? We want life-giving words to be surrounding our family, surrounding our children every step of every day. It doesn't mean we don't correct them when we're wrong. We absolutely correct them. Those correction, biblical correction, is life-giving words being spoken to them. But we need to do that in the right way. And God will bless those little steps of being faithful in the way that we use our tongue. The second thing he says is in conduct. How do I act around other people? Am I prideful or arrogant or easily angered? Do I bully people because of my position? Am I judgmental in the way that I treat people? Do I pay more attention to certain people than to other people because I like them better than the other person? Listen, people will follow more what you do than what you say. I need to be very mindful of that and I need to be faithful in the way that I treat people. Do I lead people in prayer? Outside of church, it's easy to pray in church, right? Am I leading people in prayer outside of church? When I get together with my Christian brothers and sisters, even if it's for, if it's for a fun occasion, do we spend some of that time in prayer together? If it's not, we wasted it. In my home, how do I conduct myself in my home? Does my family know me to be somebody different than my church family does? Do I act one way here and another way when I get home because I'm trying to impress people here? Brothers and sisters, it shouldn't be like that. I need to serve my family in the same way that I would serve here at church. Give myself to them in the same way that I do. The way that I treat people matters. I need to be faithful every day in how I treat people around me. And the third thing is love. How do we as a church or as an individual live out the gospel in action to the world around us? We look at the life of Jesus and what did Jesus do? He gave and he gave and he gave. Even when he was tired, he never stopped giving. You say, oh, but there's so many needy people in the church. Yes, that's why God has brought us together to minister to each other in our time of need. We don't avoid people because they're needy. We reach out to them to use the gifts that God has given us to minister to them. We're called to care for people, not to run and hide from them when we see them coming. Am I also loving at home, right? Do I give more to the ministry than I do to my family? If so, I'm working, it's not a work of the Holy Spirit, that's a work of the flesh. The Holy Spirit will not give you the strength that you need to minister at church and to love people at church, but then not give you what you need to do the same thing at home. And if you find that happening, I would say you need to, to search your heart because you're doing work in the power of the flesh, not in the power of the Spirit. <clears throat> it doesn't mean you won't be tired. Jesus was tired. Jesus was frequently tired but we still give. And those little acts of love lead to a healthy family. Healthy families lead to a healthy church. And then in spirit, it's my attitude. How do I act when things don't go my way? 
How do I act when somebody hurts me or betrays me or when something unexpected comes up? I realize that it hurts when people do wrong stuff to us. But the truth is, I minister for the Lord. I don't minister for people. My motivating factor for doing ministry has got to be love for Jesus Christ. If it's love or any other, for any other person or for some other reason, that will fall flat. Because at the end of the day, people are unloving, right? And they will hurt you and they will betray you. So I don't do it for them. I do it for Christ. And then when those things happen to me, I can get past it because I wasn't doing it for them anyway. I was doing it as unto the Lord. What's my attitude when things don't go my way? Do I let those things, do I let it ruin my day? Do I let it ruin my ministry for that day? How do I react to the people around me? If I don't have the right attitude when the little things go wrong, I'm not going to have the right attitude when the big things go wrong. So be faithful in your attitude that you have when things are good and when things are bad. And then faith, faithfulness to what he's called you to. And he's called us to preach the word, not just pastors, all of us. My life preaches a sermon every day. Even when that runs contrary to what the secular, the world's opinion is around us, I need to preach the word through my life and I need to address the issues around me biblically. It doesn't matter what the government says or what the secular opinion says. I need to address things biblically. Whether that be homosexuality or abortion or everything happening in, in Israel, opinions don't matter. God's word matters. And it's not that we need to look to be a politician, but we need to be biblical. And if the Bible addresses an issue, we need to address that thing in the same way that the Bible does. I say, ah, yeah, but what if I lose some of my friends? There are people that don't like you no matter what you do. Jesus, Jesus, the greatest man that ever lived, had people that hated him, right? Do I care more about the applause of men or do I care more about what God thinks? Be faithful. Even if all my friends were to leave me, I still need to speak the truth. Be faithful in what the Lord has called you to here and at home. Be faithful men, fathers, to love your wife as Christ loved the church, wives, to honor and and respect your husbands, parents, to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Be faithful in those things. And then the sixth thing, purity. Listen, the biggest thing that brings a ministry down and can ruin marriages is sexual immorality. And it's hard to come back from. But understand, adultery, affairs, they don't happen in a day. They happen little by little. When I allow things in my heart that shouldn't be be there. When I allow things into my mind and keep them there. When I play around with it in my mind. And I say, oh, I would never do that in real life, but it's fun to think about it. No, 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 no. That's the beginning when I allow myself to look at things that I shouldn't be looking at. That's where it starts. We have to stop those things when they start. Be faithful in those little things to stop them when they start. And it will prevent disaster down the road. It will destroy churches, ministries, families. But it starts by being faithful day to day. What I allow before my eyes, what I allow to stay in my mind and think about, what I allow in my heart. Be faithful in those little things for purity. Winding down here. It says, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Listen, there's no excuse for a lazy Christian. It's not the pastor's job only to study God's word. That's all of our responsibilities, to know God's word, to be familiar with it, to know, hey, I went into this church And the pastor was teaching and something in my spirit just did not sit right. It's your job to come back and figure out what that was. Because that probably was the Holy Spirit telling you this guy is off. What he's sharing is not from the scriptures. You can't just be reliant on the pastor. 
Know how to study the word for yourself. To exhort one another, it says. <clears throat> to encourage one another biblically. And then to be faithful in doctrine. Know why you believe what you believe. Be aware of the false doctrines that are out there to help protect yourself, to help preserve those around you from getting caught up in those things. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you, a prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. God has put all of you in the positions that you're in. Husbands, wives, ministry leaders, whatever role you play, use the gifts that God has given you. Use them for his glory, not for yours. One of the saddest things is an unopened gift, an unused gift. And God has gifted each one of you. And use that, be faithful to use that for his glory. And then look at this in verse 15. It says, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. These things, Timothy, that I just shared with you in your pastoral role, in your life, Give yourself entirely to these things and your progress will be evident. Don't give yourself entirely to building your church, to building your ministry. Don't give yourself entirely to all of these other things. He says, give yourself entirely to these little things that prove your faithfulness in your personal life and God will do all of those other things. When I do that, my progress will be evident to all and take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them for in doing this you will save both yourself and those that hear you. My life lived out in the faithful faithful things. The people around me through the message that I preach in my life has the power through the gospel to save not just myself but to save those around me. The gospel preached through my life. Guys, this list that Paul writes to Timothy, write it down, put it up in your home, strive, devote yourself entirely to these things and see what the Lord will do with your life. Like that athlete, like that runner, like that marathon runner who is so disciplined in the things that he eats in when he goes to sleep, in his training, all for winning that medal, right? For winning that prize. So disciplined, he gives himself entirely to that purpose. That's what Paul says that we are to be doing. When we give ourselves entirely to these things, our progress will be evident and God will use our lives in an amazing way. And the wonderful thing about this list here is that it's not just for pastors, It's not for ministry leaders. It's not exclusive to any group of people. Anyone in this room who would live, take this list that Paul gives and live it faithfully, God can use your life. It's not specific to men. It's not specific to women. It's not specific to old or to young. From the youngest to the oldest, these things lived out in my life will bring glory to the name of the Lord. And in that faithfulness in these little things, I will have a fruitful and effective spiritual life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that your word has the power to change our lives, to refine us, Lord God. And I pray that the things that were spoken of you today would be driven into our hearts, that we would pray them into our lives and that we would live them out. And pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.